my name is Ibrahim Fetin. I'm from the University of Derby and I'm 21 years old. I'm doing a degree in zoology at the moment, I'm a third year. And um, at the moment, um, I'm doing my IS project, which is involved with the University of Derby and I'm doing it at Sea Life in Birmingham. Um, I'm looking at the stress levels of black tip reef sharks in accordance to the abundance of people and um, the noise levels within the enclosure. Basically involves um, husbandry techniques, feeding of the sharks, obviously the food preparations as well, but my actual project was to come in um, into, the, into the enclosure, into the tunnel, and actually um, identify each, each individual shark. I would use their dorsal fin, and the black tip on their dorsal fin is basically the um, identification point. So it's basically like a fingerprint um, for humans. So it's, it's unique to every individual. So I use a technique called Image J, and Image J, what it does is it um, has the colorations of the black tip um, on the dorsal fin of the sharks and it just shows you every unique pattern. Documentation techniques basically um, involved observational techniques. So I would come in, um, for example, nine o'clock in the morning and um, I would identify the sharks using the black tips and I'd, I'd do a continuous um, observation. So I'd start with five minute intervals um, and I would actually record the sharks and their behavior and, and just uh, record any abnormalities. At the moment, there's 14 black tip reef sharks in, in, the, in the enclosure, which is the biggest amount, or the most amount in Europe. Um, and at, currently, three are pregnant, with um, one of them being due next month. And um, this is really, really important, only because, not in terms of conservation, but in terms of um, having the sharks breeding and providing offspring, which then, then can be transferred to different, different enclosures, which would increase the abundance of the amount of sharks, obviously, in the wildlife. If if reintroduction techniques are used as well. It's important to identify the shark within the enclosure just, so, just in case if, if a minor hit, mishap happens, they can straight away identify the shark and, and get to the root of the problem. It's also good for conservational reasons, as in obviously another, another key was the identification factor. They can go out in the wild and actually identify the individuals and see how their behavior changes with different independent factors. So um, whether it's uh, fishing, because they're not, they're not um, in a sense commercially big in a sense of fishery, um, but they are actually caught um, when, like, they, when, the, um, when the fishermen are actually hunting for other things. So um, in that sense it's really important to conserve the species out in the wild as well. Hello, my name is James Robson. I'm the curator here at the National Sea Life Centre in Birmingham. So my role here as curator is I'm looking after the whole collection. So that's all the animals within the group and we've got a really nice diverse collection in this aquarium which makes it really, really helpful for things like when we're doing research because we can offer a real wide range of taxa to work on. A lot of the work we do is actually behind the scenes and this is part of the behind the scenes area. So we call this the quarantine area and the way this really operates is any new animals that come into the collection, so if we've been sent it from another stud group from, from Europe or somewhere else, we'll come here first, we'll observe them, we'll make sure they're feeding well, we'll make sure they've got no parasites or any diseases before they go out onto display. Another operation for this area is this is where we would conduct any research work we want to do. So say we want to do a, a feeding trial to see uh, how they respond to different types of foods, we'd much rather do it behind the scenes where it's a bit more controlled, it's a bit nicer for the animals um, and it's, it's not on display. So this is essentially where we'll do uh, any treatments, any husbandry, but we'll also do our research work. So we've got a bit of a cornucopia going on in here at the moment. It's a, it's a real wide group of, of animals. So uh, right now we've got some animals that are going to go, go going on to display in the next couple of weeks and it's just a, a mix of uh, reef fish, so small reef fish. Um, we've been rearing them on, so we've got them in as a sort of juvenile larvae stage. We've been rearing them on, they've now got to a size where we can put them on display and share them out uh, and, and, and put them onto certain display tanks up in the coral caves. Um, we've also got, um, just towards the back, we've got some corals, live corals and anemones. That's going to be going into our new soft coral uh, display that's, that's again up in the coral cave area and then over my shoulder behind me um, we've got some freshwater rays that is part of the reason we split them up is they're breeding at the moment so once the female is pregnant the best thing to do is take the male away because what the male will do is just keep bothering the female so we take the male off show and we essentially rest the female give her a break allows her to, to basically produce the young once she's produced the young then we can reintroduce the male if we want to breed them again um, and then on my left we've got a, a series more tanks and that's a mixture of native species. We've got blue spot ribbon tails, which are a tropical stingray, and it's part of a very important stud group. group. So we've had them for about six months now, um, and we've got uh, a mixture of five females to one male. And that allows us to make sure that whichever pups we get from that particular female, 
is definitely only from one male, and that's really important for managing the genetics. So when the pups are born, when the babies are born, they're little tiny rays, we're going to chip them so we know exactly which one is which, and then when we send them out into Europe, we can track their life for, for the, hopefully, generations to come. Um, so they're just here now, and we're just, just resting them again at the moment because um, they're ready to pup. We've been ultrasounding the females, so we know that of the females, we've got four pregnant females, um, which should produce about 12 pups, so 12 juvenile uh, stingrays. My name is Dr. Michael Sweet. Uh, I'm a university lecturer at Derby. Uh, I work mainly on invertebrates, but we look into all aspects uh, of diseases and, and climate change, um, but now branching more into the aquarium and zoo se section as well. So we're, we're really excited about this uh, extra part of the collaboration with, with Sea Life. Um, and we've designed a, a whole room, quite a large room really, uh, uh, almost the size of this, uh, to turn into an aquarium research facility where we can concentrate um, exactly on uh, specific longer term projects for, for our students, for undergrads, masters, uh, all the way up to PhD students. So uh, we have started doing a, a lot more behavioural studies now um, and that's particularly with the interest from the students. They seem to be really, really keen on, on behavioural studies um, and obviously of the larger animals as well. So that's the things like the otters, the penguins uh, and the sharks. Um, so we do facilitate quite a lot of that study and, and most of that is actually going to be uh, done on site here at, at Birmingham itself. Um, as far as the work we can re uh, do in uh, the university, we're going to look at the, the smaller scale things. So, for example, the development of the different sharks and rays. Uh, we can bring them in when they're in their little egg cases. Uh, we can monitor development um, and see about hatching rates uh, and under different scenarios as well, uh, using real-time uh, climate change scenarios uh, to see how it's going to affect development stages of these animals in the future. The, the benefit to, to sea life specifically is, is obviously because um, our information comes from two ways. So quite a lot of the work uh, comes directly from questions raised by sea life staff, uh, and particularly James, the curator, um, to questions which they've either pondered on for a while uh, or they've just recently seen uh, and they want to know an answer to. And that's where, obviously, uh, we come into it and we can design projects, we can look into the, the amount of replication needed um, and we can actually implement that uh, with quite a, a strong, uh, well-educated labour force, i.e. our students.